I remember being in uh, seminary and one of the professors uh, sharing with us an interesting perspective. Uh, they said, as you prepare to grow in ministry and go preach week in and week out, I want you to think of the grind of preaching like this. It's like preparing a 15 page research paper every single week. So if you remember what that was like, you know, double space, Turabian, of course, but 15 page research paper every single week. And so you gotta be ready to do that if you're gonna, if you're gonna preach the word accurately. You're gonna dig in deep, you're gonna study, and you're gonna do all that. And I took that as a challenge because I like the research. I think it's fun to do. But I get frustrated when I can't find like the sources that I need and uh, this week I found a quote and I was like, oh, this is so good. I need to find this source, but I couldn't find it. Um, so I'm going to enlist the help of the audience here. If you have a stack of Sports Illustrated in your home from the 1980s, I need to go through it, okay? So if you have a stack of Sports Illustrated in your home from the 1980s, I need to go through all of them because I just know it's somewhere in the 80s that I got this quote from. Well, first of all, we're going to, have to talk about two things. Probably one, if you have a stack of Sports Illustrated in your home from the 1980s, we're going to need to call Marie Kondo to come to your place and just <laughs> chuck some things and make some space. But two, I need to go through it because I really want to find this because the quote is given by Royal Robbins, who's a, a mountain climber, like he climbs, uh, scales rocks like that. And it's such an insightful quote. I just want the full context to make sure I'm, I'm getting the right thing from it. But I think when you listen to it, man, it's, it's insightful for a guy who willingly climbs a wall without ropes or anything like that. So uh, listen to what he said right here. If we are keenly alert and aware of the rock and what we are doing on it, if we are honest with ourselves and our capabilities and weaknesses, if we avoid committing ourselves beyond what we know is safe, then climbing will be safe. For climbing is an exercise in reality. He who sees it clearly is on safe ground, regardless of the experience or the skill. But he who sees reality as he would like it to be may have his illusions rudely stripped from his eyes when the ground comes up fast. So think about that in the quote of a guy who's climbing and scaling a rock. He's saying, this is, this is reality. If I look at this and I'm honest with myself, if I'm keenly aware of who I am and my capabilities, my abilities, what is safe and what is not safe, if I'm thinking about that and I'm active, then man, climbing is going to be safe. The danger is when I have a, a version of reality that I want it to be, and that's not what it really is. And I thought, man, that's a very insightful quote. And I think that speaks a lot to the discipleship of what it means to be a Christian. See, where we get tripped up is when we look at reality the way that we want it to be. And that's when we start to complain because it doesn't match up to our standards or it doesn't match up to the way that we want it to be. But if we were just to simply take it and be keenly aware of the reality that Christ has given to us, what he set forth in his word, what he's asking us to do, even in the most difficult of circumstances, we're going to be safe. We're going to be okay because we're living in reality. It's an exercise in reality. I think we see that most clearly in the interaction that Jesus has in his disciples in Mark chapter eight. Why don't you turn there with me? It's such an an interesting interaction that he has with them. Because if you've been with us in the gospel of Mark, we see Jesus interacting with his disciples and man, there's something that's, that's stopping them. That's hindering them from getting the message that Jesus is trying to give them. And I think it's, they have their own version of reality of what they want discipleship to be, but you don't get to tell that to Jesus. You don't get to, you know, set the standards that way. Christ is going to do that. And man, when we, when we, when we go that way, it doesn't matter the circumstance we find ourselves in, we're going to be safe. We're going to be able to make it through. And I'll tell you up front that there are going to be some, some moments in here where it's going to feel like very difficult pressure. And you might think that I'm doing that because, you know, it's Super Bowl weekend and I'm trying to keep your focus away from the world and trying to keep your focus here. I'm not. I'm happy for the Super Bowl. I know the Rams are going to win. I'm, I'm probably going to get a Rams tattoo at the end of the game, okay? <laughs> if you want to join with me, we can go get a bulk discount or something like that. It'll be really cool. Okay, so this is not to like steal the joy from what we could be having in fellowship later on this afternoon. But what I am saying is we need a reality check. Because if all we're doing is playing games, if all we're doing is trying to have a version of our own reality, it's going to come crumbling down very quickly. Just listen to the way that Jesus talks to the disciples in Mark 8, 1 to 10. We're going to go to verse 21, but we'll start in the first 10 verses and see if that doesn't help. Listen to this. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they are with me now for three days and they've had nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on their way. Some of them have come from far away. 
And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with the bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have here? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave thanks, uh, gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few f- small fish and having blessed them, he said that they should also set these before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples. And they went to the district of Dal Manutha. What an interesting interaction we have with Jesus here and his disciples. See that opening phrase in verse 1 sets it kind of in the context of where we were last time in those days. Meaning it's around the same time as the miracle that he just did last week when he caused the deaf man to hear and he, he opened up his tongue. Remember the guy's, the, the guy's tongue was shackled and he released it because he has that power from God to be able to do those miracles. And it's in that Decapolis region that we find Jesus, which is a mainly Gentile region, but it will have some Jews who are there visiting. Uh, but it's a mainly Gentile region. And we begin to think about his statements to the Syrophoenician woman. Remember that, that whole interaction that he had with her, that, that intentionally provocative interaction where he was trying to draw out from her, I'm on a plan of redemption. I've come, I'm, I'm going to save my people, the, the Israelites, but that doesn't mean I'm, I'm not going to the nations. I just need to go in the right order, the Jews first and then to the Greeks. So we see Jesus here performing a very similar miracle that he did in chapter six to the Israelites there. Now he's doing it to the Gentiles showing how gracious he is. Remember in the interaction, it was kind of like, hey, if the crumbs come down to the Gentiles, that's a good thing. But we see the story here. He's not just giving them crumbs. He's giving them a full meal and they're satisfied. What a very interesting interaction we have. See, I hope last time as you begin to think about the amazing savior that we had, we meditated on the phrase, Jesus does all things well. And I hope this week when you prayed that it, that it encouraged you, I hope that when you served, it it caused you to strive harder for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. But I want to ask you this question. What if it didn't? What if when we we, we said that phrase and we emphasized it and you thought about it, what what if you didn't really care? What if you didn't think about it a lot? What if there was like an apathy that happened in you? What if there was just like this lack of desire to even respond to thinking about Jesus doing these amazing things and to think that he could even do them in your own life should he choose to do so because he's Lord over all. What if there was that, that lethargy that was in you? What do you do? Well, I think you have to avoid what the disciples have clearly shown is going on in their lives. And that's, they're forgetting their purpose for being called disciples. In fact, why don't we write that down for number one, okay? If we're going to avoid this lethargy, this ineptitude as disciples, We cannot forget our responsibilities. Let's write that down, number one. We cannot forget our responsibilities. Jesus has called us as his disciples for really two main purposes. He's called us as disciples to go proclaim the gospel to the nations, to be fishers of men, to go out and to to tell people that there is an answer for your sin problem, that the sin that separates you from God can be forgiven in Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection secures your salvation when you put your faith and trust in him. But it's not just that one aspect. You don't just proclaim, but you should also progress in your likeness to Jesus Christ. That's what being a disciple is. If you think of it, I think it's in Luke 6, somewhere around verse 34, 35, 36, somewhere around there. It says, a disciple is not above his teacher. But a disciple, when he's fully trained, will be like his master. So those are the two really main focuses of us as disciples. We're going out and we're proclaiming the gospel, but in our internal, our, our inward focus, when we're challenging one another, men, like we talked about at the, uh, the guy's breakfast yesterday with the spiritual disciplines, our aim for doing those disciplines is that we look more and more like Jesus Christ as we walk away from doing those disciplines. But notice what we have going on here. Jesus, again, describing himself as somebody who is compassionate and we have disciples not doing anything. How does that happen? I think they've forgotten. This is one of the main things I need to be doing. I need to be learning. I need to be conformed into the image of my Lord and Savior. What an interesting way to put it. Now, last time, if you remember in chapter six, I think it was, Jesus rolls up on the scene 
And Jesus is described as being a person who has compassion on the people, right? That's Mark describing it probably from Peter who was there, the eyewitness. And he described as Jesus having compassion because the people were like sheep without a shepherd. And he cared for them and he taught them that way. But that was a description. Here, listen to the declaration of Jesus. I have compassion on the people. I think this is the only time it's declared in the first person. Matthew chapter nine is the same thing. Jesus, he's looking out on the, the people and the, the author Matthew says he had compassion on the crowd, right? He looked at them and he had compassion on the people. But here, Jesus is declaring, this is the type of person that I am. And if you are my disciple, you should be matching this type of compassion. But the disciples just don't seem to get it. He says, I have compassion on the people because they have been with me now for three days and have had nothing to eat. And if I send them to their homes, They'll faint on their way because some of them have come from far away. Now, what's interesting is we have kind of a similar situation to chapter six. And do you know that there are some scholars out there who look at this situation and they go, this has to be a repeat by Mark. Okay. He's got to be mistaken. This, this can't be the same thing happening because there's no way the disciples are this dumb. Okay. <laughs> That's not the, the scholarly terminology that they use, but that's the way that I would describe what they see the disciples doing here. The disciples, you're telling me, who just two chapters ago saw Jesus do almost the exact same thing, are now asking this question in verse four, how can one person feed this many people? They think there is no way somebody could forget something that important twice. And you know what I want to direct them to? I just want to ask those scholars, have you ever seen Home Alone one and two? <laughs> Did they forget something important twice? The McAllisters, they forgot Kevin at home twice, but I don't think those scholars will accept home alone as a like real legitimate case. So why don't we go to a biblical one? Why don't we go to Psalm 78, Psalm 78, Psalm 78. And I want you to see something. I think it is very possible for the disciples to forget what had gone on because this type of forgetfulness has plagued the people of God since sin entered the world, essentially. Psalm 78 just gives a beautiful description of the amazing works of God and then the failure of mankind to understand that, to remember that. So look at verse uh, 34, verse 35, sorry, of Psalm 78. So he's just given these descriptions of the great things God has done. And watch this, watch the way it's described. Psalm chapter 78, verse 35. They remembered, meaning they had forgotten something, okay? They remembered that God was their rock. The most high God was their redeemer. Take a look at verse 36. But they flattered him with their mouths and they lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast towards them and they were not faithful to his covenant. So they were in a difficult spot. Then they remembered, oh yeah, our God's really powerful. We should go to him. But what's the description? They're flattering God because they just want to be saved, delivered from their, their physical circumstances. They don't want God to run their life. They don't want God to be God. They want God on their own terms. But take a look at verse 38, see if it doesn't sound similar to ours. Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and does not come again. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe, when he performed his signs in Egypt and in the marvels in the fields of Zoan. This has been the, the perennial problem of the people of God. To see the amazing works of God to just be so acquainted, to, to literally experience that in their life. And then at the next moment when they could be trusting God who has saved them, they forget it right away. What do you think is going on with the disciples? A few pages ago, Jesus is looking at the crowd. He has five loaves and he does such a miraculous thing that each individual disciple walks away with a basket of bread to be a reminder. Wow, my God can do clearly far beyond anything I think or imagine. And then when the same proposition presents itself, they forgot. See, I think that goes back to the quote I said at the beginning. The disciples are viewing their discipleship with the reality the way that they want it to be. 
Now, maybe we could cut them some slack. If you want to go back to, to Mark chapter 8, maybe we could cut them some slack. Maybe they're, they're trying to think, you know, Jesus is on a mission to, to save the Jew first. He's got to go on to the cross, and then the, the message is going to go to the Gentiles for salvation. Maybe they're thinking that, and because they're in a Gentile land, that's why they want to get back there. Maybe that's what they're thinking, but I think this is just an ineptitude or an incompetence on their behalf because they're forgetting the miraculous word of God and what Jesus wants them to develop, a care for people, that, that compassion. Remember we talked about that, that, that inward feeling of compassion. That's when you know you have it. I was reminded of that, like what that feels like a few weeks ago. Maybe you remember that. If there's any athletes in the room, you will remember this if you watch it play out. I think it was three or four weeks ago. Uh, it was the, the Chicago Bears versus the Philadelphia Eagles, okay? Okay. We have the, the Eagles up, I think, by a point or two. The Bears get the ball back, and they're driving down the field. And you're thinking, wow, they're going to do this. So they get there. Trubisky's making some beautiful passes. They get themselves set up for a field goal. The field goal will win it for them and send them into the next round. So they get their kicker out there. He goes up. He kicks the first one, but they call a timeout right before he goes. But you see the first one go through the uprights, and it goes through, and people are like, okay, this guy's got it. The very next play, when he goes back to do it, he kicks the ball, a fingertip hits the ball, and it knocks it onto one of the field goal posts and then to the other one, drops to the ground, doesn't go in, and the Bears lose the game. If you're an athlete and you've been in that position before and you saw the kicker go down like this and put his head down, you felt in your gut, oh, I know that feeling, right? Unless you are a heartless Packers fan like Pastor Jesse, you know (laughs) that feeling, who I'm sure rejoiced and sent a lot of, probably not God-honoring texts at that point in time to people, but we'll give them grace. But just, if you're an athlete and you see somebody lose the game for their team and you've ever done that, you hurt with them. You're like, oh, you know, if you could just be there and let the guy know, hey man, we'll get him next time. You, you just want to put your arm around them. Even though it, like it is the guy's fault, he should have made the kick. Even if they're in that situation because they didn't do something they should have done, you're just, I know that feeling, man. Let me be there with you. That's that inward compassionate feeling. Do you have that towards people? Because if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, this is his declaration. I'm telling you who I am. I have compassion on these people. And they've been with me for three days, so enthralled, probably with his teaching, even though it's not mentioned, so enthralled with his teaching, they're not even eating at this point in time. They're just trying to soak up their time with Jesus. And he goes, if I send them back now, they're going to faint. I'm thinking about these people, but the disciples are put in almost that exact same scenario. They were in six when Jesus said, you give them something to eat, don't send them away. And they're like, how can anybody do this? Do you remember that was the same condescending tone that came from Jesus' hometown. Mark 6, how could this man do this thing? This is his disciples who should be growing and increasing, but their forgetfulness of who Jesus is and what his mission is and what he's here to do and how they should be conformed to him, they're forgetting that. How about you? You getting so busy that the compassion that you should have for other people is not there? Like, just think about it, like a real example today. Like you could be hosting, maybe chances are you're hosting a Super Bowl party. What if at the end of this service, you were sitting by somebody and that, you know, they just were struck by something and they're just, they're broken down and they're crying. And you would think, oh, you know what? I can't really, I got to go, I got to go prepare for the Super Bowl party. I mean, that's analogous to what is going on here. You, you would never think that if you had compassion on people, like if you saw somebody hurting, you shouldn't be caught up in the mundane things of this world in order to go and do that. But these disciples They've forgotten what their mission is. They've forgotten who Jesus is. They've forgotten what's going on. So watch what Jesus does, okay? Verse five. So he just, he says, all right, guys, you need to see it again. How many loaves do you have? And they said seven. What's interesting, again, about the the people who really think this is just a doubling or recapitulation of the same story, notice the differences, right? Jesus was the one who said, I'm going to do this for the people. In the other story, the disciples wanted to send the people away. Here, they have seven loaves, and the other one, they had five. He directed them now to sit down just on the ground, and the other one, he sat them down in rows. So there's just all these differences. 
He took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the people and they set them before the crowd. He had a few small fish and having blessed them, he gave them also to the people. So now there's two prayers here as opposed to the one there. So this is just another example of Jesus doing something miraculous in order to take care of some people who really need some physical help. What an incredible thing to think about at this point in time. If you take a look at verse 9, it gives you another different detail. And the people there were about 4,000. The other one was 5,000, and they went away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmutha. Now, what's so interesting here is that Jesus, again, has patience with his disciples. He's going to show them again, this is what it means to have compassion. You are going to go care for these people. You are going to look at them and you are going to long to help them because that's, that's what I do. You're going to have compassion upon the people. They're not getting it, but he has patience with them because he's getting in the boat with them and he's going to minister to them. The reason why we stop and point that out is because in verse 11, we have another person, another group introduced into the story. Take a look at verse 11. The Pharisees came and they began to argue with Jesus. So he's getting in the boat, ready to go to another side with the disciples. The Pharisees come seeking a sign from him, a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply with his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And they left them and they got into the boat again and went to the other side. So there's a difference with the way that Jesus interacts with the failing of the disciples and the failure of his enemies. I want to highlight that, okay? So Jesus is patient to, to walk with you, to watch you develop. When you get to those points in times, and like, like we said at the beginning, you're not keenly aware, you're not alert, you're not um, aware of your weaknesses, where you need to grow. Jesus is patient to, to still be with you, to, to stay with you. He's going he's gonna to do that with you, but he's going to challenge you. And we'll see that again in a moment. But when the, the enemies come, the prideful enemies who are going to, to come after Jesus, he's, he's not going to spend time with them. Notice what they come doing. They come again, and since chapter 3, they've never denied a miracle that Jesus has done. Like, they're not here denying what Jesus just did with 4,000 people. It should show you again the authenticity of the miracle. They're not trying to say, oh, look, he really didn't do that for 4,000 people. All they're trying to say is, hey, by what ability are you doing that? What authority is going on? Remember in chapter three, it was, oh, you do this by the power of Satan, right? And Jesus says, Satan's never going to cast out demons in the name of himself. And here they're trying to say, okay, you really think that you want us to believe that this miracle is from God, this power that you're examining is from God. Well, then you do a sign that lets us know that this is from God himself, a sign from heaven, but Jesus won't have any of it. It's very interesting that we have the humanity again of Christ here. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. That's back-to-back weeks that we see that. And what I love about this, what it teaches us, the utter faithfulness of our Savior. You know the reason why we know we can stand before God? Because at this moment, Jesus, in his humanity, stayed faithful to God. Think about this. He's just like, you're just fed up, right, with your disciples. (laughs) They forgot the miracle that you've done. They're not thinking compassionately like you. So Jesus is obviously righteously probably frustrated with them. But now he gets an attack from his enemy, okay? And that's at a point when he is very, very, you know, frustrated with his disciples, righteously so, because they're not getting it. I want you just to write down, and you can reference it later, Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, I think it's verses... um, like one to 10, somewhere in the beginning of that story, Numbers 20. And what you'll do when you get there is you'll see that that's the, that's the story of Moses uh, interacting with the the rock, the way that God didn't want him to. If your kids were in Awana two weeks ago, they saw probably a very inaccurate representation by Mike and Matthew acted out in like a very um, funny way. But the truth of the story, they communicated to them. So if you want the story to be retold, you can go ask the kids. I'm pretty sure the recollection of it will be funny. But they, react, they, they retold the story where uh, Moses was told by God, okay, to provide water for the people, go speak to the rock. But what did Moses do? Took a staff and slammed it up against the rock, okay? Now think about the children of Israel that are there at that point in time. How many times did they forget who God was and what he'd done for him. Over and over again, they're complaining. They're complaining. They're complaining. 
They're complaining so much that Moses gets so upset. Oh, fine. You guys want water again? He doesn't obey what God says. He does what he wants to do. And you know what Numbers 20 says? Because you did not believe in me and you didn't guard my name as holy, you're not going into the promised land. Now think about that episode juxtaposed to here with Jesus. Does Jesus have the power and authority right now at this moment to do a sign from heaven that would shut the Pharisees up? Absolutely. I mean, if I, if I were Jesus at this point, I'd be like, all right, guys, fine. You want a sign from heaven? I'd be like, you, re- you remember that old uh, YouTube lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, right? YouTube that. If you haven't seen that, it's brilliant, okay? I would just literally, I'd take lightning bolts and I'd just start burning things. I'd be like, you want to know if I'm from heaven? Take a look at that. Like I'm fed up with people at that point in time. But Jesus stays true to the mission of God. He's not going to get deterred that way. And the fact that he stands fully righteous in everything he ever did before the father lets me know that when I confess him as my substitute, that in every aspect, even to the the most minute attitude, he was always perfect and pleasing the father. And that is juxtaposed to these people. Now watch what happens. He left them. That's different. The disciples he's with, he leaves these people. He's done with his, his enemies. Notice he calls them. I find it so interesting. Why did he say generation? right? This generation. Why didn't he just say Pharisees? If you write down Psalm 95 verses 10 and 11, you'll find out that I think he's making a connection there with the faithless generation that would see the signs of God over and over again and refuse to believe it. God was upset with them and Jesus is upset with his enemies here for doing that. This is what we have. Jesus has set this up. The disciples, they're just so forgetful and that forgetfulness unfortunately is going to lead to something in their uh, application of what God is asking them to do. It's going to lead to a a form of of apathy. Take a look at verse 14. Mark 8, verse 14. It says this. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. This is almost comical, right? They had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. I mean, just think of the incompetence of these people. Like it is almost so funny if it weren't a real story happening to Jesus, watching it unfold. But think about the warning that that is to you and I. Do you think you're under any less temptation to be forgetful in what God is calling you to do or be apathetic in applying it in your own life. If you think that you are not tempted by that, then you have a version of reality that you've created for yourself. And you are allowing things to come into your path that are going to distract you from doing what God wants you to do. Jesus is giving a warning to his disciples here and all they can complain about is bread. I had the, I mean, parents, you've had that experience. I know you have. I know you've desperately like pled with your children to, to do something or teach them something. And then just afterwards, you know that they, just right over their head, they didn't even remember it. It happened to me one time with uh, Miles and Trenton. It was probably two, two and a half years ago. We were uh, driving back from church one night and it was the 4th of July weekend. And one of them asked like, hey dad, why do we celebrate the 4th of July? So I put on my, you know, Toby Keith outfit, and I began to describe how proud I am to be an American. At least I know I'm free, and I won't forget the man who died, you know, and I'm talking about all the great things that we enjoy as Americans, and you can start to hear the battle hymn of the Republic in the back as I'm beginning to just just describe to these kids how lucky they are to live in the United States and all that they've been blessed with at that point in time. And I go on for like 15 minutes, and honestly, if my arms were long enough, I would pat my own back because... It was such a convincing speech to my sons. How can you not be happy being an American? At the end of that, there was a pause and Trenton boy goes, hey dad, can you stop talking now? (laughs) Okay, son. I'd be happy to acquiesce to that wish of yours. You know, you just, you, you pour your hat out sometimes as parents and they just don't get it. This is Jesus here with this, this, this warning, right, to these disciples, and they're literally discussing bread. Let's, just, let's, let's put it under a point, and then let's begin to discuss it, okay? If we have to watch out for the forgetfulness, that's number two. We cannot be apathetic with our transformed abilities. 
We cannot be apathetic with our transformed abilities. When you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, when he opens your eyes, when he gives you, remember those eyes to see, those ears to hear, that heart to love him, those are these transformed abilities that you have to exercise, you have to use. You can't become apathetic with those. And you have to be aware, like we were talking about, keenly aware, alert at the beginning of, of the temptations, of the weaknesses that you have. Because if you get caught up in forgetting what God has done for you, and you don't use what God has blessed you with, then man, you're going to be ineffective for the kingdom of God. You're going to look a lot like the disciples right here. Think how foolish this is, okay? From these two stories, 5,000 plus men and women, 4,000 plus uh, women and children, we're probably talking upwards of 30,000 people that Jesus has fed with 12 loaves of bread. And these disciples in this boat have one loaf of bread for 12 people. And they're concerned, we might not have enough bread to go around. They're foolish. They're not thinking. They're not doing what we tried to do last week by getting you to think about Jesus doing all things well. The reason why you have to work that out in your mind is because if you don't use the mind that God gave you, you're going to set up your own reality the way you want it to be. And do you understand why you complain? Do you understand why you say things like, ah, if, if I didn't have to work so much, then I would serve at church, you know, or ah, if, if, if our kids weren't so young, then I would be at, at small group or accountability more often. We construct realities of the way we want things to be. And we act that way rather than saying, what is the reality I find myself with and the call that God has given me? And does he give me the ability to carry it out? That's the way we need to think. But these disciples here, they're just complaining about it. I read such an interesting thing with uh, Tom Watson and Jack uh, Nicholas at one point in time. They were playing golf and they gave this insight into what uh, Jack Nicholas would do. What he would do before the, the weekend is it, Tuesday or Thursday and Friday he's playing. And then when the weekend would come, he would start to read the newspaper. And you know what he'd be looking for? His opponents being interviewed because he wanted to see which one of them complained because as soon as he saw that his opponents were complaining about either the weather or how hard the course was or how they wish it was better kept, he knew he could cross them off that, their list as somebody who was a real threat to him because complainers have already lost. See why? They've, they've set up a reality the way that they would like it to be. Oh, I wish the weather were better. Oh, I, I wish the course were easier. Oh, I wish they would have less traps here. And they're complaining about things they have no control over, trying to construct a reality of the way that they want things to be, rather than just dealing with what's on their plate right there. Nicholas knew, hey, I'm going to win this event because I'm doing what I'm capable of doing. You as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're called to use your mind. You're called to exercise your love, your emotions towards Jesus Christ. Look at the way that Christ calls his disciples to think. Verse 17. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Look at all those faculties that Jesus has enlivened when he saved you. He gave you a new mind. He gave you a new heart. He gave you this remembrance that you should have of all the great things that he's done. And he's asking you, what are you doing with those things? Because all they're doing is just constructing their own reality of the way that they want things to be. Guys, honestly, people who go to church week in and week out, let, let this be a, a call to you to ask yourself this question. Is that what I'm doing? Am I constructing reality the way that I want it to be and acting that way? Am I not as faithful as I should be? Am I not trusting God as much as I need to be? Because over and over again, God has said in the scriptures, this is the way it is. Trust me for it and I'll get you through it. The disciples, all they needed to do was just meditate on the fact, oh yeah, we've got Jesus in the boat with us. Jesus took care of us. And even if we don't have enough bread, I know he could do something else. And at some point in time, he will deliver us. Why? Because he has done all things well. You got to train your mind. Man, isn't that what we said yesterday at the men's breakfast? Isn't that why you do spiritual disciplines? Not because you're trying to earn salvation by reading your Bible more, but because you have to have a disciplined mind. Jesus is appealing to their mind. Don't you know? Can't you perceive? Can't you understand these things? That's why you have to think like a soldier, a farmer, an athlete. 
And those people who are successful in those realities don't view reality the way they want it to be. They deal with it the way that it is and use the capabilities they've been blessed with. God has blessed you with so much as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what it's like to have a new heart to love Christ? Like you get to love him, be devoted to him, start to have your character conform to him, start to minister to people, watch God's word, do amazing work. You get all of that because God's given you a new heart. But do you think about that? Do you exercise that reality? Are you constructing reality the way you want it to be? Take a look. It's not just your abilities, but he talks about his accomplishments. They said, uh, he said, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And then for the seven, for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? You see, now Jesus puts the final nail in the coffin for all scholars who want to say, this is just a repeat. Jesus describes, I did two miracles. Remember, I did it once. He's got different words for the baskets. The other one, the the 12 baskets were smaller ones. These, uh, These other baskets, they're big, massive ones. Like the one that Paul had to be let down in. Remember when he was let down in Acts, I think it was nine. He had to put him in a basket to let him down because he was gonna be uh, killed by someone. So it's a basket to hold a man. It's that big, seven full. But they're different words for baskets. So it's not the same event. Guys, don't you understand? Do you not yet understand? That should drive us. That should show us as disciples. There is a a trajectory that we're aiming towards. That Christ likeness that we're to be growing on. And we're not going to be faithful proclaimers if we're not progressing in that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5 to see this. Don't think, guys, that this is just a temptation for our church. Hebrews chapter 5. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 5. We've got to be diligent to train ourselves. That's what a disciple is, being fully formed, to be like our master. It will take hard work. But because we've been graced with God, with the power of his spirit, we're able to accomplish it. But listen to the warning again that comes in Hebrews 5, uh, 11 to 14. About this, we have much to say. He was talking about Melchizedek, making a very interesting point. But it's hard for him to explain that. Why? Because the people have become dull of hearing, sluggish in the ears, if you just wanted to translate the original. Ask yourself this question. Do I attend services? Do I hear biblical teaching? And am I slow to apply it in my life? Am I sluggish? Because it sounds like you would look a lot more like the disciples whom Jesus is rebuking if that seems to be the case. Now, guys, here's the the beauty of the church of God. Here's the reason why we come together in a small group to meet with other people, because we understand it's very difficult. We're not saying that this is easy. We're saying this is extremely hard, but God in his wisdom has given us a church body of people to help encourage, to help grow, to help make sure that this is happening in your life. But you don't get to be a part of the the group of people that is pushing and shepherding towards Christlikeness. You're being a pull on that if you're sluggish and slow to hear. Do you have the humility to ask that question? What if you asked it to your small group leader? What if you asked it to your pastor? Come in, sit down with Jesse and I. You know, we'll take you to coffee. We'll make you pay. And then we'll go ahead and have a great conversation. Are you you, you slow to hear? Do you not understand? Are you not perceiving what God is? He's clearly saying these things to you. And if you're not, then what, what can we do to help you? What can we do to change? Because we believe that the spirit of God is in us. If we walk by the spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So it's not that we have to walk around defeated. It's not that we have to walk around like we have no power. We have the power of God within us. You just have to exercise it. The disciples, they're apathetic, lethargic, incompetent, inept. Guys, that cannot describe you if you love Christ. It should not. You are a disciple. You are on a trajectory to grow, to be like him. Utilize that. What does it say? Verse 12. For by this time, you ought to be teachers. Again, a trajectory. See, it's growing. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the, their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good 
from evil. Men, that's what we were talking about at the men's breakfast. Train that, discern that. Ladies, that's what, we're gonna, that's what you're gonna do in a different capacity at the women's event. It's what you do at Dwell Richly. It's what you do in accountability. You're training yourself to say, I'm not gonna see reality the way I want it to be. I'm gonna be safe, even if it's a difficult reality, because I'm gonna acknowledge where I am and I'm gonna ask God for the grace to use the abilities that he's given to me. Go back to Mark. I love that phrase, do you not yet understand? Again, just showing his patience. What a patient God we serve. To, to, to be with his disciples and to, to walk with them as they're doing this. He's already used this. Chapter four, verse 40. Remember, they're in the boat. They're complaining to Jesus. You don't care about us. There's a storm. He calms the storm and he says, do you not yet have faith? Do you not have that full mature faith you should be aiming towards? Do you not yet understand? You should be understanding. So guys, when, when you ask these questions, don't think this is your yeah, pastor Elliot's asking you to do this. Don't think this is Compass Bible Church's way of Christianity. Look, this is Jesus looking his disciples in the eye and saying, do, is this the way you think? Do, do you not yet understand and use that? I don't want you to do it because I'm telling you to do it. I want you to do it because Christ requires that of his disciples. And if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, you're his disciple. So say, is there any area? Where, where am I lethargic? Where am I apathetic? Where am I missing something? Let God reveal it to you. Let, let a brother or sister reveal that to you and watch you be able to conquer it because of the power we have in God's word. You know, I said this yesterday to the, uh, to the men at um, the breakfast and I thought it was appropriate to close here with it as we did yesterday with it. There's a perspective on, um, I was reading an article on how you become a great journalist. So I was very interested in that. And as I was reading it, he made just a, a stunning statement, and I was so struck. I shared it with the guys yesterday. I think it applies here as, as, as well. Listen to what the author said. To be a good journalist, you have to be well-read. So he says this, being well-read is a transcendent achievement similar to training to a 26.2 marathon, then showing up for the marathon in New York City and finding 50,000 people there. It is at once superhuman and pedestrian. And I think that's a great description of just the discipleship of Jesus Christ. In one sense, it is this transcendent experience that can only happen if the power of God is there to take you from dead to alive, to take you from blind to seeing, to take you from deaf to hearing. It is at once that transcendent experience. But you know what? It's not just you. It's pedestrian. It's common. It's common to all believers. There's not one believer who doesn't have these abilities, who doesn't have that heart or mind or eyes or ears to see. We've all been blessed with the same spirit and the same abilities to do what God is asking us to do. We want to challenge one another to do it. It's at the same time superhuman. At the same time, this is just common. This is what we do. Have you gotten into a routine aspect of it too, though, where you're apathetic? Are, are you lethargic? Are you inept in, in your discipleship? Don't be satisfied with that. It is so beneath the, the worthiness of Christ. Go to him and, and become more conformed to the image of Christ and watch God do some amazing things with us here at the church. Let's go to God and ask that he'd give us the grace to do so. Lord, you are worthy because you have saved us. There is no disciple who's understood himself enough to get into the kingdom of God that wasn't first delivered by you, awoken by you, given eyes or ears or hearts to see, that wasn't taken from dead to live. There's no disciple here who, um, who, who earned his way into the kingdom of God. It's all been brought in by grace. And yet, Father, you long for your disciples. You've set up discipleship to, to be this aspect where we would be more conformed to your image so that when we proclaim the gospel, we're proclaiming a gospel that really does change lives. So God, may we be accurate in the gospel of grace, saying it is never of us, it's only of Jesus. Salvation by grace through faith, but then let that salvation, that seed, the power of God into salvation, turn to be the real grace of God in our life that would conform us more into his image. God, so that you would get the glory then as we mimic your son, who is so compassionate. The fact that he would correct his disciples and be patient with them and compassionate with them um, as he's dealing with them, God, is an encouragement to us. May we encourage one another that exact same way. Not only should we challenge the same way, we should encourage and comfort the same way, Father. So may we do so with the mindset of a shepherd. But God, give us a hunger and a passion to live for you that way. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would do that. Amen.